From the Atlantic Council Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security, this is NATO 2020, 2020, a new podcast series pitching fresh ideas for the world's oldest military alliance. I'm your host, Terry Schultz, and I've been covering NATO a long time, so I know a lot about how it's been doing things. But this series is about how it could be doing things differently. The Atlantic Council commissioned a series of 20 recommendations as to how the 70-year-old alliance could freshen up a bit heading into the next decade. Some of these are ideas we've heard before and some are brand new. All of them are aimed at making NATO more responsive and resilient to the threats that do get more creative all the time. I'm going to be digging into those ideas with their authors. In this episode, the recommendation is to disband the NRF, the NATO Response Force. The, the author is John Denny, a research professor of joint interagency, intergovernmental, and multinational security studies at the U.S. Army War College's Strategic Studies Institute. That's a mouthful, John. Thank you for joining me. Terry, it's a pleasure. You should see me try to get that on a business card. <laughs> Definitely. I understand it. Um, well, let's start out here. I mean, we're going to be using lots, lots of acronyms, which I'm sure you need on your business card. But I am going to have you encapsulate what the NRF is. And, and then we can talk about why you think it shouldn't exist. Because as you point out, most of these initiatives are about something NATO could add to its arsenal. And you're saying the best thing it could do is take this one away. That's right, Terry. Well, first, thanks so much for uh, for inviting me to participate in this series. And thanks to the Atlanta Council for publishing my essay. Yeah, as you know, my essay is a bit unusual. Most of the other essays <laughs> propose that the Alliance do something new or add something to its repertoire that it's not currently doing. Mine argues that instead the Alliance should do away with something that I think is not very efficient or very effective at what it was set out to do. And that is to disband the NRF. The NATO Response Force or NRF is essentially NATO's 911 force. It's a multinational force, mostly comprised of European NATO member assets, military units, that sort of thing. And its job is essentially to be NATO's rapid response force. So if there's a crisis somewhere, if there's uh, an emergency, if, um, you know, heaven forbid, there's uh, an attack on one of the allies, the NRF would, in theory, be the, the tool that is first used by the alliance. It'd be the first force on the ground. It's a multinational force, as I mentioned, consisting of thousands of allied troops from across most of the alliance, mostly European members. It was started back in 2002. And it came about in the wake of allied operations in the Balkans, especially Kosovo. In that operation, Americans were mostly operating the high-tech military equipment, flying most of the advanced uh, intelligence, reconnaissance, and stealth bombing missions. And in the wake of it, American defense policymakers realized that many of our European allies, not all, but many of them, did not have the capabilities and the capacity necessary to keep up with the US and the other high-end allies. And so they created the NRF as a means of spurring allied capability and capacity development. Uh, it, it entered what the Alliance calls its sort of initial operating capability back in 2004, but then really came about uh, as a force the Alliance could tap into starting in 2006. So, I mean, if, if you were listening to this, you'd think, why wouldn't somebody want that? Why wouldn't NATO need that? Because, of course, um, while many of the operations are broader and more long term, especially in deterrence, it's about being present. Um, there certainly are crises that require um, more rapid movements. Now, you and I know that, and we'll talk more about this, that the NRF isn't actually as agile as it sounds, and that um, sometimes rapid response for NATO means 30 days in movements, but let's talk more about that later. I mean, just to start with, how on earth could you not need this kind of a, of, of a capability? Well, in fact, Terry, the Alliance does need this kind of capability, but I argue in my essay that what the Alliance tried to do in setting this up, its, it's primary strength at the time was, you know, we're going to build this multinational, mostly European force that is going to be able to rapidly respond to crises. Well, the problem is that that multinationality has essentially become its Achilles heel, its primary weakness. Let me explain that in a little more detail. First of all, 
the alliance has, has, been, has used the NRF only four times in its existence. It used it twice in 2004, once for election support in Afghanistan, once for uh, Olympic security during the Athens Olympics, and then twice in 2005 for disaster relief assistance, once in Pakistan for the earthquake, and the other time uh, in response to Hurricane Katrina here in the U.S., where I am. And so the alliance has never tapped into the NRF for serious security crises. Uh, the most obvious one that stands out most recently is, uh, of course, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Now, Ukraine's not a member of NATO, so I'm not suggesting the alliance should have sent it to Ukraine, but we know that at the time, Poland, the Baltic states, Romania were very nervous. Uh, they were made nervous by Russia's invasion. The, did the alliance tap into the NRF and deploy it to these countries just as a means of reassuring them and maybe deterring Russia from taking further action? No. And the reason is, again, we go back to this issue of multinationality these multinational military formations that were seen as a defining strength, that is getting a lot of allies involved in this process, um, showing solidarity, in fact, is its primary weakness now. And it's prevented the allies from reaching consensus to actually make use of the NRF. But let's talk about that. So it it was sent to um, help with disaster relief, uh, but it wasn't sent to what was actually sort of a political disaster for NATO um, of, of um, you know, remaining uh, sort of ineffective in the face of, or I don't know about ineffective, but uh, w without having a strong and, and um, really robust response to the invasion of, of uh, Crimea, to the, to the seizing of Crimea, the annexation of Crimea. So was this, and, and I lived here then and I covered NATO at the time, but I wasn't aware that there was a discussion, um, if there was, that then got nixed about using the NRF in some capacity then. Are you telling me that there was this, this debate about whether that was an occasion on which the NRF should be deployed? My research indicates, and again, this is mostly based on off-the-record uh, conversations with uh, NATO officials and those on the ground, was that this idea was indeed discussed, but was never brought about for a formal decision. And so it's not as if there was a vote on this or, uh, you know, to use NATO parlance, this decision never entered sil the silence procedure. Um, it never got that formalized. But the alliance had at its disposal a tool ready to respond to the very clear need for security and reassurance in the Baltics and in Poland, as well as Romania. And this unit wasn't tapped into. Instead, what we saw was the allies relying upon their bilateral relationships. Uh, in this case, Poland and the Baltic states calling up Washington and asking if on a bilateral basis, America could do something in terms of reinforcing them, putting some American boots on the ground as a means of, again, assuring the allies and the citizens in those countries and deterring the Russians from doing anything else uh, aggressive or dangerous in the region. Well, that's a standing request, as you and I both know. That's something that they ask for and have have always have asked for 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 many years. But certainly reinforce that that uh, that need uh, in in their eyes um, after Crimea. But um, so so this would then back up your your um, presumption that the NRF really isn't useful because in the at the time when when it was the most pressing crisis closest to NATO's borders, um, it wasn't deployed. It, That's right. The, the okay. alliance needed to do something to respond. Uh, there was a clear need for it. It should have used this unit and it didn't. And so we have to ask ourselves why and what should the alliance do about it next time so it's better prepared. Well, I argue in my, in my essay that the why is, uh, as I mentioned, there are allies that contribute to the NRF that are reluctant to see it used in this way to essentially put their troops within harm's way. There's also some political disagreement within the, the alliance writ large over whether and how NATO ought to be the first tool in, in, in responding to crises like this. I mean, as you can imagine, as you know, you know, there are differing schools of thought within even the, the the allies themselves over whether 
NATO should be the first responder, or maybe the EU should be the first responder to a crisis within Europe. The NRF gets caught up in debates of this sort, and therefore the alliance has been reluctant to pull this tool off the shelf. In fact, in the essay, I compare it to an antiquarian book, right? Like something I have here behind me. Well, not that I have expensive books here, but you know, if you go to an, uh, you know a flea market and you find a very expensive book, a uh, very old book. You might buy it, but then you're not going to take it off the shelf very frequently uh, because it is very valued, right? Um, and so the, it ends up being a showpiece. In many respects, this is what the NRF has become. It's very expensive to maintain it, and the alliance has yet to use it for its intended purpose. That is crisis response. What would the NRF have done in that in that occasion? I mean, it, we all missed it. It was done, and the, there was there was no, no question of of NATO or of any um, singular country or or any um, group of countries going in to to Ukraine and if fighting back Crimea. So uh, you know what I mean. What would what would the NRF's response? Um, and again, you're not arguing that the NRF is the appropriate response, but just to help us frame frame it, it, its usefulness or to debate its usefulness, what would the NRF have done on that occasion? I think what the NRF would have done is, first and foremost, what the alliance has arrived at eventually today, the, the alliance has established these so-called enhanced uh, forward presence units. These are about a thousand troops each in each of the Baltic states, the three Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and in Poland. So today, the alliance has a thousand troops in each multinational formations, that is, there's troops from across the alliance, and they are there both to deter Russia and to reassure the citizens of those states. Now, those forces were only set up in the 2018 timeframe, but they were needed much earlier than that. They were needed back in 2014 when the allies in this, this region, the Baltic states and Poland, were very nervous. Uh, and they remain nervous today, but they were very nervous then and lacked this symbol of allied solidarity as both a symbol as well as a commitment, a real commitment on the ground. The NRF should have been used in that way, but it was not. Okay, that makes sense. So, so these thousands of forces that make up the NRF, you're saying should have been reconfigured to create what are now the enhanced forward presence groupings, uh, battalions, basically, um, in these four countries. So, so you would have said that if the NRF were effective and, and were useful and people thought of it that way and, and you know meant to make use of it, it would have immediately in 2014 become the four uh, the four deployments that are now EFPs. Exactly, and in okay. fact, we we see the challenge with regard to using the NR the, the NRF at all, right? I mean, one of the reasons it was not deployed was because there was some serious uncertainty within the halls of NATO over whether Russia's actions in Ukraine were just a bad passing storm or were in fact representative of what you might think of as you know international security climate change, right? A real dramatic shift in how Russia was going to be uh, treating the West and how the West should respond. That debate unfolding within NATO prevented the NRF from being used in the same way that now the enhanced forward presence units are fulfilling the function of security and deterrence in the Baltic states and Poland. Isn't this just a matter of of titles? I mean, why why would you call them? I mean, do you, you understand what I'm saying? You have the NRF and, and then you had to come up with troops. And I remember, you know, them having to come up with the, the lead nations and then who was going to be second and who was going to staff them and, and all of those things. Um, you just call them by a different title. It, so, it could, Terry, you're right. It could be a matter of semantics. The problem is that in addition to these enhanced forward presence units that are in Poland and the Baltic states, the alliance is still paying and exercising to maintain the NRF today. So it's not as if we established the enhanced forward presence units and then you know disbanded the NRF. The NRF still exists. It's still sapping resources from our defense establishments in Europe. It's still on standby. And I argue it's never going to be used. Okay, so this is this is where we get into your argument because these forces, these new capabilities, were not pulled out of NRF resources. Correct. That okay. is correct. Okay, so this sets it up for you perfectly. That EFP had to be created separately and, That's and right. had to be had to be generated completely separately. That's right. Essentially what happened was the alliance had to go and find what are now called the framework nations. For example, the UK, the United Kingdom, is the framework nation for the Enhanced Forward Presence Battalion in Estonia. 
they, that means that country, the UK, has to go and organize all the other contributing members of that enhanced forward presence battalion. Now, the framework nation in the lead in Latvia is Canada, and in Lithuania, the lead is Germany. The US is the lead in Poland. So instead of relying upon the NRF, a force in waiting, its job is to be at the ready whenever NATO decides to use it or whenever a crisis erupts in the alliance. Instead, the alliance had to go essentially asking and finding these different framework nations and then the different contributing countries to formulate these enhanced forward presence units. This obviously took significant time and effort, roughly a year from when the EFP idea, the enhanced forward presence idea or proposal was approved, and when these units were actually able to get on the ground. And that was pretty quickly. I mean, they had some trouble finding. Um, <laughs> I remember them having to talk uh, talk countries into taking them over. Um, but uh, but you know that that wasn't that wasn't very slow. But in fact, the NRF prides itself on paper anyway at being quick. And you know, actually, we we make fun of the NRF a lot. I feel kind of bad um, <laughs> for the unloved NRF. You know, we we laugh about how the um, you know they're very quick. Uh, capacity is 30 days. So basically, if there's a threat, you say, hold it right there, stop that. I'm, I'll am i be there in a month to, you know, make you make you get out or whatever. You know, it, it, it isn't very credible if you're looking at it as, as sort of the sharp tip of the spear. There are, I guess, some some parts of it can, are, is supposed to be able to deploy within 48 hours, which is relatively new capability, which is within the last few years. But um, it is kind of a, a hodgepodge of, of um, of a sort of threat and deterrence uh, capabilities. But um, why, uh, my, sort of my question would be, um, why didn't they in that case, because nobody, it, because it was difficult to pull together, um, pull, to, pull together more capabilities and more resources, what happened in that discussion where somebody didn't say, we have the NRF um, and, uh, and, and we can use it? And you said, you have mentioned it a couple of times, that um, it comes down to consensus. But why was that consensus then not applicable to the EFP, which, by the way, NATO considers a huge success and the host nations consider a huge success. They're, you know, they're, they're quite popular. So um, why couldn't that have been done with NRF pools and then the NRF could have looked successful? It, it, it might have been, but I think in the case of the NRF, again, there were there was some disagreement within the halls of NATO uh, without getting into the, the specifics of which countries went which way. Uh, frankly, there was just disagreement within the alliance over tapping into this tool. Now, we should note, though, that the NRF, uh, let's not, uh, I don't want to denigrate the NRF too strongly. I mean, I think you're right that its response, some of its response times, response timelines could be sped up. But you know, the fact is the countries that contribute to it, they spend a lot of money and make a lot of effort to make sure that their units are trained up, ready to go and responsive. Uh, it's not an inexpensive or easy endeavor. Some elements of the NRF, specifically now the very hybridist joint task force uh, known by the acronym VJTF, uh, yeah. can respond, as you mentioned, within a couple of days. So it has the capacity and the capability to operate very quickly. The problem is that decision-making consensus. Now, some of this is, as I mentioned, based upon political disagreements within NATO about whether the NRF is going to be used at all. And there are some countries in the alliance who really would prefer not to see it used at all, even though it's a tool on the shelf. I think they view it as a, you know, uh, an absolute last resort, uh, break glass when necessary. Uh, it just hasn't been necessary from their perspective. But um, I, I think the, the challenge is also the fact that we're talking about an intergovernmental organization. It is necessarily going to take decisions much more slowly, ponderously, than a single state will. Right. And so it's easier in some respects for uh, the president of Estonia to call up the prime minister in the United Kingdom or the president in the United States and say, we have a problem here. We need your help. Can you respond? You have a single decision maker there that can make a decision very quickly. In the case of NATO, of course, we have to achieve consensus. That becomes increasingly difficult the larger the alliance has become. But EFPs were set up within NATO, so why are they? Why was the decision making any easier for for the enhanced forward presence than it was for NRF? I think I, I just I just don't get that. Well, let's remember the EFPs weren't set up, weren't agreed upon in 2014 when the need first arose. They were only agreed upon a couple of years later, as it became clear to more and more members of the alliance that in fact what we were seeing on the part of Russia was not a mere one-off. 
In fact, what we're seeing on the part of Russia was a dramatic change in the security climate in Europe. And, and the invasion of Ukraine was just the tip of the iceberg, right? I mean, as you probably know, folks uh, that pay attention to security in Northeastern Europe know that there are airspace violations by the Russians of NATO allies, as well as partners Swinland and fin Sweden and Finland, almost every week. It happens on a regular basis. They're Be careful, also not incursions, but they buzz very close to, to, to we, we, we discuss this at NATO a lot. They, they, they get very close to NATO airspace. They don't necessarily uh, make incursions, but they threaten. If you, it, it requires it requires scrambling, let's put it that way. It certainly does. And it, it, sometimes this is in the eye of the, eye of, of the observer. So at the same time, we know that Russia has also conducted, continues to conduct, a variety of uh, both small and large scale no notice exercises. Sometimes right. we have a hard time discerning these from preparations for an actual uh, incursion or invasion of some kind. And so it's these sorts of things. You couple, uh, you layer on top of that the hybrid warfare that Russia has engaged in uh, over the last couple of years. My point is, it wasn't clear in 2014 what became clear by 2018, and that's when the EFP units really began to come to fruition. Okay, so then following on from this, uh, would the NR would NRF decision making have evolved? Has it evolved now? So that given what we now know, given the changes in the way of thinking that allowed the EFPs to be created, perhaps the next time, um, should there be a next time? Would do you think it would that it would be different? I mean, obviously you don't because you think we can get we can get rid of this function, but um, it's possible. I'm not convinced it would make a difference. Uh, in my essay, I argue that uh, we not only have to deal with these sort of political challenges of just pulling the NRF off the shelf and using it, but we have to be prepared for the the, the potential challenge in terms of um, if there is a consensus that something should be done by the alliance in response to a crisis, uh, there may not be complete agreement by the contributing member states of the NRF force, whoever they are at any given year, because it varies year to year. Right. These forces are on call for a 12-month period, uh, and, and it changes every year. There may not be complete agreement on every country's contribution being sent to wherever the crisis is. So I liken the NRF to a tower of Jenga blocks. If, if you're familiar with this game, you know that I've the, got game, kids. <laughs> the, game, the game is played by trying to remove blocks without having the tower fall over. In the case of the NRF, if a contributing country says, oh, I'm not going to send along my assault helicopters, or I'm not going to send along my intelligence collecting assets. You know, at some point, we reach a point where that tower is going to collapse. And in the case of the NRF, it's a multinational formation. If it doesn't have all of its capability and capacity, it simply is not going to be effective. So I argue in the essay, this is another reason why the alliance needs to begin to move away from fixed multinational formations like the NRF. I was going to say, this isn't only the NRF that's subject to that kind of limitation. Any shared, any truly shared capacity um, in NATO is subject to this. I mean, any NAC statement, anything like that. So this is um, this is uh, perhaps a flaw in working as consensus, which is another discussion that the alliance has on a regular basis, right? This it, is it, just simply a tangible, a tangible function of it. It is. And in fact, uh, in many respects, I think... Um, the United States and similarly minded allies kind of uh, brought this upon themselves. And you may recall in the 1990s when the alliance was discussing or uh, debating whether and how it would go out of area, right? That is beyond the territory of the member states to engage in Bosnia and yeah. in Kosovo. Uh, at the time, the thought among many of the allies was if they agreed that the alliance should do that, that meant they had to send forces. Well, Washington and some other allies argued, no, 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 that's not the case at all. That would be a good thing if you sent forces, but <laughs> right. but we can uh, pull together sort of a, a coalition of the willing allies that do want to contribute. Well, that's become a real serious problem now because in many cases, allies will be willing in Brussels to vote in favor of an operation or activity or a response, but then be unwilling to contribute to for the forces to make it actually work on the ground. So next, John, when you say we, we shouldn't have this, of course, you say 
you've got ideas for what it should be replaced with. And um, you, you and, and your your ideas are some some things that that already um, exist in in smaller forms. But tell me um, those countries that are sort of wedded to the idea of having this capacity, even if they don't use it. Um, how would your suggestions fill that that need, even if it's um to this point a theoretical need? Well, I think there's you know, those that argue in favor of the NRF claim that it has really contributed to building up capabilities within Europe, to building up interoperability, uh, to building up capacity within Europe. Uh, I think some of those things are probably true, but I argue in the essay, the NRF isn't the only tool that NATO has at its disposal to allow it to do that, right? So one of the things the alliance relies upon to reach those goals of capability, capacity, and interoperability is, for example, its exercises. It has an array of other non-NRF exercises. Just between January and June of this year, there are going to be 18 of those exercises. So we can rely more upon those kinds of activities. I also argue that the alliance ought to think about shifting to what I call more of a plug and play kind of interoperability. So moving away from fixed multinational modes of cooperation, uh, multinational formations like the NRF, and instead uh, a plug and play interoperability so that uh, the units of one country uh, can plug into or next to the units of another ally. Now, we like to think that we have that kind of interoperability in NATO today, but it does not exist at the levels we need it to. Hmm. As, as we know, allied forces, allied military establishments today are smaller than they were a generation ago. So we don't need simply divisions within the alliance to be able to work together side by side under some other allies' core headquarters. We need companies and battalions far lower in the echelon or in the, the, the hierarchy of command to be able to operate together. That is extraordinarily difficult. The Alliance tries to do some of that right now in the enhanced forward presence units that we talked about earlier in the Baltics and Poland, but it's a real struggle. It's a struggle in terms of language, English proficiency. It's a struggle in terms of the equipment, having the right radios that can talk to each other in a secure way. So it's this kind of plug and play interoperability that I think the Alliance ought to shift toward. It will take time and effort. It won't be inexpensive, but I argue the alliance can take the resources being devoted to the NRF and instead spend them on this plug and play interoperability model. This will enable the alliance to be far more responsive and agile, relying upon coalitions of willing allies, right? Instead of trying to pull something off the shelf that may not have all of its constituent pieces, it can instead tap the allies that want to participate in a specific operation, knowing that they're already interoperable. So um, who, who pays for NRF resources and how would that money go back into preparing the kind of capabilities that you're talking about now, the, the, the plug and play um, pieces to, to simplify? NATO relies upon this notion of the costs fall where they lie. And what that means is if you are, if you as a country or an ally are going to contribute forces to the NRF or to uh, an enhanced forward presence battalion or to some other exercise, uh, one of the ones I mentioned earlier coming up between now and June, you have you, your country has to pay for the forces to exercise and to travel to and use ammunition and spare parts, all that stuff, they fall on individual allies, not upon the alliance. And so what I'm calling for, frankly, wouldn't change much in terms of the cost dynamics. The cost would still fall upon those allies willing and able to participate both in the train up, the preparation, the readiness, as well as the operation that would then unfold be approved by NATO. And so would those countries providing a plug and play option, um, would they get the same benefits that some of them obviously feel they get now with the NRF? Would it, would it be much different at all in terms of training opportunities, in terms of um, interoperability training, language training, all the other things that they get now? From my perspective, there wouldn't be a change at all, right? I, I would argue that, in fact, all we would need to do is essentially use the same uh, organizational and um, uh, convening power uh, that NATO has right now and simply direct that toward a plug and play interoperability model. Again, focused on rigorous exercises for all of the allies that want to participate with an eye toward building up this, this ability to operate seamlessly uh, side by side with allies and also in a hierarchy. And how are you stripping away the need for consensus then? You, you sounded like um, a country could just ask for one of these deployments. I mean, how would, how would it be arranged that um, they would get the help that they need? 
Well, it would still be incumbent upon the, the NAC, the North, North Atlantic Council, upon the alliance and its member states to agree that there's going to be some kind of NATO operation. But in this Which case- Which requires consensus again. It, it does. And so I'm not saying that, that the alliance, that the allies lose control over- uh, they don't lose any sovereignty in this sense, which is very important within the alliance, right? Among all the members, they want to maintain control over life and death decisions. That's vitally important. Um, they wouldn't lose control over it, but if they made a decision that yes, the allies are going to, the alliance is going to partake in an operation, undertake an operation of some sort, instead of looking to the NRF, they would instead look to those allies that were willing and able to contribute at that time. And of course, as we know, depending upon where the alliance is going to get involved, those are political decisions that 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 will you know, shift allies one way or the other in terms of whether they're really willing to put forces on the ground. So you think it simply would lower beyond that, beyond the original NAC decision, it would lower uh the, the weight of, of the decision so that you could be more agile after the initial decision is taken? Because otherwise, it sounds like you might change the packaging a bit, but it doesn't sound that different to me. Harry, I think what I'm suggesting is that instead of relying upon this tool on the shelf that looks a specific way, that has specific allies in it, who may or may not be willing to shed blood and treasure for a particular operation, that the alliance has said, yes, we should do something there. Instead of relying upon that fixed asset, the alliance would then look to allies that were willing to contribute, right? Again, we would avoid that Jenga tower situation or scenario where the alliance says, yep, we should go do something. They look to the NRF and maybe an ally or two that's contributing to the NRF says, oh, I'm not so sure I want my forces involved there. We would avoid that scenario. Okay, I get it. It wouldn't be prepackaged so much because you it wouldn't be um, automatic that, that that there were terms that, that countries had to put in in the NRF so that they, they would have more ability to say yes or no, right? In which case they could move more quickly and, and more independently. Correct. It would put a demand on force generation that would be unique for each operation. And NATO already has experience doing that for Afghanistan and other operations. Okay, so in sum, um, uh, I've dragged this out. I, I mean, I, I, I wanted to know how this worked. <laughs> and may, maybe everyone else wasn't fascinated, but I was, and I needed to know this. Um, so how would how would this be received at NATO headquarters? It sounds like there are some countries that are, um, that are quite fond of the NRF <laughs> sitting there on its shelf, as you say, and wouldn't want to change things. I mean, the, the alliance is, you know, sometimes resistant to change, just kind of, um, you know, it takes a long time. It takes a long time for new ideas. So is this something that's been discussed and, and is it considered wildly radical at NATO headquarters? I don't think it's been discussed yet. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of the reasons why I propose an alternative is because I think it's highly unlikely the alliance would agree to simply disband the NRF, right? I mean, to do away with something that has arguably contributed to the development of capabilities, capacity, and interoperability, that would fly in the face of reason right now, given the threat that Russia poses to European security and to the alliance. So I propose that instead we have this plug and play interoperability model. As I mentioned, I don't think that's up for discussion just yet, uh, but clearly there are allies within the alliance that would like to see the NRF used uh, more frequently, uh, would have liked to have seen it used in 2014. Uh, I don't doubt that this is going to be uh, a difficult political discussion within the alliance, but I think the alliance, uh, it, it's vital for the alliance to take on this debate because frankly, it's wasting resources, right? It's building up the capability and capacity to maintain this NRF thing that is simply not being used. I don't think it's ever going to be used beyond the disaster relief that I outlined earlier about 15 years ago. Which so, isn't much a deterrent for Russia. Exactly. So in an era in which our defense resources are limited and likely to come under significant pressure from the recession induced by the pandemic, why would we as allies build up and maintain an asset that simply sits on the shelf? It's not efficient. It's not effective. And yet this is the way it is. And yet this is the way it's been done. You're right. I mean, and and perhaps now the uh, the budgetary pressures with, um, as you mentioned, with the COVID, you know, downturn in everyone's economies, maybe this is the time for people to look at what's practical. You know, we, there is a lot of talk about plug and play. I've been on many, many, many exercises where they state that the, the desire of this exercise is to have plug and play capabilities, but you're saying to do it on a, on a larger scale. I'm saying to do it on a larger scale and also to push that level of interoperability down the hierarchy of command, 
One could argue that we do have some degree of plug and play capability, at least among some of the leading allies at the brigade level, yeah. right? The brigade's yeah. roughly what, three to 5,000 troops. We need to push that down lower to battalions and companies because frankly, most of the allies can't, they don't have the capacity to even field a brigade, right? They just have small militaries, which is fine. They're professional militaries. That's a good thing. But we need to push interoperability down lower so we can get more contributions from across the alliance. Makes sense and a good time, a good time to be having this discussion when uh, everyone's looking at uh, ways to both uh, boost their uh, their defense spending on their own militaries as required by the 2% pledge and uh, and become more efficient um, with increasing threats and, and the the 300 NATO 360 looking all the way all around at threats coming from other directions. It, uh, it makes sense to me. <laughs> There have never been more demands on our militaries and our, our defense establishments, Terry, from the challenge presented by Russia in terms of its its uh, its conventional military to the nuclear dimension as well. It's hybrid war against most of Europe and NATO uh, to the, the challenge of uh, insecurity and instability emanating from the Middle East or sub-Saharan Africa. And most recently, the challenge of China and how that manifests itself in security challenges in Europe. So our defense establishments are needed more than ever. And I I think this is not a time to be wasting resources in any capacity. All right, John. Well, thank you very much for making your case here. Uh, I really appreciate you uh, explaining your proposal to disband the NRF. Um, so this has been John Denny from the U.S. Army War College's Strategic Studies Institute sharing his idea with us. And you can find all 20 ideas at Atlantic, AtlanticCouncil.org. Tell us what you think on Twitter at hashtag StrongerWithAllies. Thanks so much for being with us and join me again next time. Mm-hmm.